Welcome to the Off the Charts Football Podcast. I'm Matt Manicharian, former NFL scout and now of Sports Info Solutions, joined by Aaron Schatz, the godfather of football analytics and the founder of Football Outsiders. As always, we've got our producer, Justin Stein, with us, Mark Simon as well, doing work behind the scenes. And today we have our guest, Mike Sando. You know him as a longtime NFL reporter. He's now the senior writer at The Athletic, and he has put out his annual QB Tears article where he interviews all sorts of people from around the NFL, the true insiders. I guess that was a little bit of a different process this year, but um, (laughs) he put the tears out and we are here to grill him on the quarterbacks as we finally get started with the NFL season tonight. So Mike, first of all, what is up? You know, the season is, I can't believe it. It's here and it looks like we're going to at least have a week one. So I'm taking it one week at a time. You can take it one day, whatever you want. But we used to sort of take it a season at a time, right? And I, we can't do that now, but it feels a lot better that we're going to actually have games. Yeah, absolutely. Aaron, I guess you, uh, you get, go back with Mike years. Is that right? Well, I mean, I've been doing stuff for ESPN for a long time, and Mike did stuff for ESPN for a long time, so we knew each other, saw each other at things like the uh, Fantasy Rankings Summit, and always see Mike in Indianapolis for the Combine every year. There's another thing that I have no idea what it's going to be like next year is the Combine. But yeah, I'm hoping we have something figured out by then, but I guess I keep hoping that. (laughs) Everything is let's hope we have something figured out by whatever (laughs) thing we want to do in the future. But it's hard. It's hard to imagine that we did the combine this year. Like that was like two weeks before everything went crazy. And we were all just like hanging out in bars. Oh, you know, when this thing came out this week where they had the, the Bob Woodward tapes and it was all dated and stuff, I was thinking, we were at the Sloan Analytics thing. I mean, that was that was like March 8th. And that was the first weekend. That was the first time that I was actually walking around with hand sanitizer because we were starting to hear about it. But we weren't really as attuned to the, to the, to the you know breathing part of it, you know. And we'd see people and we were doing the sort of the forearm, you know, uh, shakes, handshake. And by the time we got home, I was like, I wish I didn't go. I mean, yeah, I was in a huge auditorium. The Biogen conference that was like one of the the first super spreader events was in Boston the same weekend as Sloan. And basically we just lucked out to not be at the conference where everyone got sick. But we, I was going out to bars and restaurants and, you know, by the end of it, I I was being careful, but we were washing our hands more. We, heck, standing and talking to people, we weren't that worried about it. So we just didn't know, but. Right. And at the time the guidance was don't wear a mask. Masks don't help. (laughs) <laughs> that, that probably didn't help matters. Uh, but we made it. And hey, we were just talking before we started recording. The NFL doing much better than we would have thought on oh. September 10th. Certainly a few weeks ago, it was not looking like it would be this good. So that, that's it, that's definitely positive. Very worried. I, I was worried. And, you know, worried for the health of the players, too. I, I thought, I mean, we, we still don't know what's going to happen. But I was thinking, OK, is this going to be a situation where if you just look at these percentages that, you know, maybe one or two people die? I mean, that seemed reasonable to me. So um, hopefully nothing like that happens, but it's a serious matter. And I think it's gone better than we thought. So we'll take that. All right, let's talk quarterbacks. So I have to say, I learned from reading the the quarterback tiers article that I've kind of been taught a very similar system to what you do with the tiers here. So Michael Lombardi, who was my boss in Cleveland for a year, would talk about quarterbacks in terms of being guys that you win because of that you win with, that you win uh, in spite of, and guys that you can't win with. And that's really similar to to the way sort of your tiers break down, at least the top two. And I had no idea that this was derived from Chuck Knox. I had no idea uh, that before that he had said that quarterback was just another position um, and later revised his stance on that. So that was all fascinating to learn about. And, you know, as I deal with, you know, dozens of new scouts every year, and I'm kind of teaching them about quarterback evaluations. It's good to know where what I'm teaching actually came from. Well, yeah, you know, and, and so for me, you know, I, I've been, you know, it was funny, I was at ESPN when Total QBR came out, right? And that was sort of, uh, I actually kind of became an evangelist for it, but it, it really got me down the path of trying to figure out what matters the most, right? And we'd look at QBR and we'd be like, you know, that's pretty close, but how's Mitch Trubisky so high? We know he's not that good of a quarterback or whatever. And that, that type of thing still happens statistically, right? I mean, where we, we look at something and we're like, God, it's 90% right, you know, but it's 10% wrong. And that's the part that drives you crazy. So I think though, the fundamental aspect of football um, that hasn't changed is how much do we have to help this guy to win the game? Right. And, and that 
these tears come from conversations with people in the league. I mean, I didn't come and say, hey, guys, these are the tears vote. It started out with me, you know, being at ESPN and sitting there with Bill Pulley and looking at the QBR stuff. We actually did that. We were we were like, hey, what can we learn from this? I mean, what are you seeing? You know, is there anything? And, and you know, and then I would start to take it. I got this insider job at ESPN where I'm going around the league. I'm talking to people and you just bouncing things off of them. And and really, it's a scale of how much help does your guy need to win the game, right? And if you're tier one, you need less help than if you're tier two or three or four. I think it makes sense, you know. And when the ratings come out, I think it generally makes sense. Now, we're always going to have a guy we see a little bit higher, but it stacks, you know. And I'm kind of looking on my screen at like almost a color coded rendering of it based on how many votes in each tier. And it just flows to where. You know, like in the second tier, Brady's got 22 votes in the, in the top tier. Lamar Jackson, 16. Roethlisberger, 11. Stafford, 5. Matt Ryan, 4. You know you know what I mean? It just it fits into a place that makes sense. Well, it's funny, Aaron. I don't know if you think this, but from the world that we live in of looking at things from an analytics kind of driven lens, this couldn't be more subjective. It is by definition a very yeah. subjective evaluation system. And yet, it's also great data. And this is a thing that's lost on a lot of people, that data doesn't have to be a 40-yard dash time or the number of yards that you got. It could be a lot of expert opinions combined together. And I think that's why what you're talking about is what you end up with. You end up with something that, that really matches the intuition because you're seeing a whole lot of experts group their, their wisdom of the crowds together. Yeah, it's interesting because it also it brings you places to look at numbers. Like, is there a reason why the numbers have certain quarterback much higher or much lower than the tiers do? It gives you a reason to look in closer to what the numbers say, and then vice versa. The numbers give you reason to look at the subjective stuff and ask, why is it that people have, you know, Dak Prescott r- r- rated a lot worse than his numbers would suggest from last year? And uh, so that's a great great place to start. So. I wonder, we kind of said, what if we talk about the most interesting quarterback in each division? And I think there's a pretty good argument for Dak Prescott to be maybe the most interesting quarterback uh, in the entire league. Aaron, what was your reaction to seeing that, that he placed out all the way at the bottom of tier two at number 12? Right. It's, it's interesting because part of the thing with Dak is that his numbers are not as strong in 2018 in 2017 as they were in 2019. So you do have to sort of, you know, say, oh, is there a little bit of a one, one year wonder thing going on here? But after watching him play last year and knowing how good his numbers were, I mean, he was number one in our DYAR for total passing value. What surprises me is not that he ended up in tier two. It's that 14 of 50 voters put him in tier three. I can definitely get the argument for why Dak Prescott is tier two instead of tier one. I might still put him in tier two, but I can't yeah. get why after what he did last year, you would put him in tier three. Yeah. And you know what happens? I think I encountered this with Russell Wilson. You know, I think it took, it took a little bit longer for Russell Wilson to climb. And what happens is, you know, people see the context that you're playing in. In Russell's case, he had a top five defense, maybe it maybe a historically great defense, Defenses were also concerned about Marshawn Lynch. It was more of a run-heavy scheme with play action. We knew Russell Wilson was good, but we also saw that he wasn't putting it all on his back when they're winning the game 20 to 17, right? Now with Dak, I think last year they were averaging, what, 27, 28 points a game. I mean, they were putting up good numbers. You probably deal with a little bit of a lag time from, okay, I'm talking to 50 people. A certain number of those people, maybe maybe they have a perception based on their scouting grade coming out, right? And uh, like if you talk to enough people, you're going to have some outlier guys, right? But but for somebody like Dak, who came in lower, came into a situation where, you know, just for fun <laughs> this year, I, I did something where I just, hey, I took over the last four years, how good were your supporting cast? And I and it wasn't a statistical thing. I just said, how many of your teammates on offense have been to the Pro Bowl? Or how many of how many starts did you get by guys who were into the Pro Bowl that year? And Dak was way at the top. There's a perception that he's had the best line perception he's had the, one of the best running backs even though we can debate i mean some of the numbers we don't think ezekiel it's this or that you're not going to tell that to someone in personnel who think he's a good uh, a good running back and all of those things going favorably for him he hasn't had to elevate them and then you get in a playoff game against philadelphia and he's not all that accurate he doesn't elevate them 
you know, they're not playing an all-time great Philly team. He couldn't couldn't get it done to the degree people thought that he should be able to do. I think there is an element, a little bit of QB wins going on too. I think that people still, um, until, you know, the Cowboys going 8-8 eight eight last year, it is easy to sort of subjectively say, well, the quarterback maybe wasn't as good as his numbers because they went 8-8. Eight eight. So I'm, I'm guessing that there's a little bit of an element of QB wins going on in that. Well, so, somewhat for the playoffs, certainly. I think we measure, you know, when I sit on the Hall of Fame panel, you know, how much the quarterback and the coach can to, can drive success in the postseason matters. But when you look at when you look at the Cowboys over the last four years, you know, in win percentage, they're seventh in the league. I mean, they're they're almost tied with Seattle. So I think they've they've won. I think people like Dak. They don't see him. So you get into the nuance of this. Like they see that team still as a team that you know the opponent's going to be geared up to stop the run game and the play action, and that in a pure dropback setting, which is as hard as it gets for a quarterback. Dak Prescott probably wouldn't be um, one of your five or six or seven top guys, even though his stats may be better. You get into that with like a Kirk Cousins. Kirk Cousins can have great stats. Ryan Tano can have great stats, but people look at him and know what they're not. Cousins and, is definitely the player who has the biggest gap, I think, between what stats say about him and what scouts. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Like No one in the league is going to look at Kirk Cousins and go, you know, wow. I think he's better than Rodgers. I mean, they they see different things in the two in the two guys. They see them play the game differently. So on Dak, I think some of that is that and, and a combination of things. But still, you know, how high would I move Dak up? I would have had him over Carson Wentz just on based on what's happened. He's one spot below him. Would you put him above Matt Ryan? Yeah, I might. Yeah, I might. But I don't know how much higher I'm going to go. Would I put him above? Stafford, Roethlisberger, Lamar Jackson, Brady, Watson. Uh, I don't think so. I think I would put him above Stafford at this point. Yeah. Yeah. Roethlisberger would be an interesting conversation about how much last year means. Lamar Jackson, I wouldn't. So we're, we're really talking about three spots for Dak, yeah. right? So in this whole thing, Dak, he's, we said he's 12. We said we actually think maybe he should be as high as eight. We're not going to die on any hills for that. You know, that's pretty close. The other question, it's interesting, is the goal here, do you guys think about or do you propose to people, are they supposed to be what tier they think the player will be in in 2020 or were in in 2019? Yeah, I try to ask them what do they think they are? You know, what are they all, what are they going into this season? You know, and so that can be, you will get some guys say, you know what, I'm going to lean towards, I feel strong enough that he's going to be a two next year that I'm going to make him a two. Uh, you know what I mean? But for the most part, I think guys in the league want to have seen it. And that's why, you know, in this tier four category, tier four is either like Ryan Fitzpatrick, we've seen you for 10 years. We know what you are. We don't want you to be our starter the whole year. Or it's, you haven't done it enough. You know, it's like a Daniel Jones got a bunch of tier fours. Not that people hated him, but they just he didn't start even a one whole year. They want to see it. I bring that up because you mentioned Hall of Fame voting. And I think that when you talk about postseason performance, Postseason performance compared to regular season performance, it's not really predictive if a guy has a better, a good playoff performance. You know, I don't think, at least based on research, that that people who are play better in the playoffs in the past are going to necessarily be better in the playoffs in the future. But if they're better in the playoffs in the past, that absolutely happened. So, like, I absolutely agree with bringing that up in Hall of Fame debates. Yeah, I, I think all, you know, all of these things enter in to varying degrees in the minds of the voters, right? I mean, no one's sitting there going, oh, you know, in a good playoff game. Like for Matthew Stafford, he's never won a playoff game. But people in their mind go, well, they never win there. I mean, I think that if you put him in Kansas City, they might have a championship too. Um, that you're making that decision on your own based on knowing what you know about Detroit, right? Knowing what you know about Stafford, because you can see, watch him play. Uh, you know he can be good. You know, in a two-minute situation, he can be excellent. Um, you think he can do basically every everything anyone else can do, but because he hasn't done it, done it, you're not going to push him up in the top tier. But because they're so crappy as an organization, they have one head coach since 1973, a full time coach, who has a winning record, Jim Caldwell. I mean, it ain't Stafford. You know what I mean? You can you can rationalize that. So all of these things go into it. And I think for Dak, getting back to him, um, it's a combination of those things. And he 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 has risen. You know, he had been in the top of the third tier because people people really thought it was a supporting cast and a run running type team 
Yeah, I want to get back to the Hall of Fame conversation, but uh, just to kind of tie up the the Dak conversation, I think he is just a classic tier two. I have a really hard time imagining him being anything other than that. To me, he's almost uh, like the definition of what a yeah. tier two should be, in my opinion. If for, for the reasons that you're saying, the, the guy that you win because of, the guy that in the drop back game, Mike, like you point out, where that's the real difficult thing, where when the defense can make you play left-handed, can you do it? Um, that's where you say, uh, I don't know if I want to. I want to just put my team on on Dak's back and go every week. That. Yeah, but like you feel like he's going to do it sometimes, right? You feel like he's going to do it sometimes, but not all the time, right? And you can do it with him. You you can win with him. Certainly, he's benefited from a great offensive line, uh, the running back, no doubt about it. But I, I do think that. To say, you know, to me, when once you get below tier two, there's something that's kind of hamstringing you a, a little bit. There's a reason why you're not going to win the Super Bowl with this player that that is going to be be really restricting you and holding you back. And and I don't see Dak like that. I, I did see him like that coming out of Mississippi yeah. State, but I think yeah. I learned really quickly I was wrong on that one. Yeah, and like we saw with Russell Wilson, once Russell got paid and the roster eroded, the test was, are they still a playoff team, right? And I think that's going to happen to Dallas, right? I mean, they're gonna, they got all these contract commitments. They, they've already lost some pieces on their offensive line. I don't know that their roster is going to keep getting better than it's been under him. So if he makes up the difference, they're in the playoffs, win a game here and there, I think he'll go be a high two. Jared Goff is sort of the flip of that, by the way, because the Rams have started to lose players and they didn't make the playoffs. And if they go like seven and nine this year, then that's a statement about Jared. What happens when Jared Goff loses all the pieces around him? You know? Well, I was just going to say he's the ultimate, like, uh, came into a horrific situation, Goff did, and was horrible. Then seemed to have everything going great for him, including the new play caller who was whispering in his ear out on the field before the snap. And it looked great. And then it regressed off. And you know, he's sort of been in the surf, washing in and out, right? He hasn't been able to stand in the sand and be where he's at what, no matter what's happening with the waves, right? Uh, he's gone back and forth with the waves, so he's probably, you know, in, deserves the Tier 3, right? I mean, he's, he makes some great throws, but is he the difference? And uh, for these, those two guys, total points really matches what you see there. Uh, total points per pa- – just passing total points per snap last year. We had Dak number 10 kind of fitting in right, right near there in the ranking, and Go- Goff's down at 20. And I, I think that, that that sort of a rate stat matches up, at least with those few guys, as you mentioned before, as it does in with somebody like Kirk Cousins, who comes out number two. Um, and that's way above what we would expect from him. Yeah, it's very interesting, though, isn't it? I love to just take all these components. Like, to me, quarterback tiers is a wonderful snapshot of what the league thinks. And ho- if I do my job, it, we explain the why. And as long as we understand what we're evaluating then we don't have to have stupid debates on the internet where we're yelling at each other, right? And, and you're an idiot or I'm an idiot. No, this is how the league sees it. Now we can debate, should the league change how we see it? You know, like I, I had ish, you know, I, I struggle a little bit with like, what do you do with Lamar Jackson? He's different. You know, I mean, he's so freaking valuable. He's the best player on the field when he plays, but you can also throw it 58 times and score 12 points because that aspect of the game isn't as easy for them or him as a young quarterback yet, you know? And and so I think the tiers are well-defined. I'm glad it matches up with sort of how you were trained. And I think it serves a wonderful purpose to, ha- to put them this way. And most of the voters get it. All right, Aaron, where do you want to take the conversation next? I think the next interesting quarterback is Cam Newton, because I was shocked that Cam Newton got a vote in tier five <laughs> because of the fact that we have no idea what Cam Newton is right now means the means both you don't know how good he is, but also you don't know how bad he is. So given how he's played in the past, like it would seem like a stretch to like determine that he absolutely is finished tier five. Yeah. So you talked to 50 people. He got votes in four tiers. He got 14 in tier two. Those are the people who are like, Hey, you know, first half of 2018, he was a good ball player. And I think he's had time to get healthy. That's what I think we'll see. Right. Then you get 29 votes in tier three. And that's kind of like, look, he's been a two before, maybe even a high two. But he certainly wasn't the last time he left us. I'm going to put him in a three, and he's got to play his way out of it. That's most people. Six tier fours, that's like, you know what? I, I think he's going to have a hard time staying healthy. He hasn't played well in two years. I mean, he's got to show he's a three. And there's one guy, you know, who says, I think he's freaking finished. <laughs> and that's a five. So, uh, you know, I think it shows us the uncertainty, right? I mean, we, and we haven't seen him in preseason or anything. So I, I think I'm as anxious as anyone to see how it goes. But I think I feel more optimistic now. And, and for quarterback tiers, I'm talking to these guys in May and June and July. And so during that time, our opinion on Cam could shift a little too. And maybe that's why you have, uh, 
you know, it was, I might have talked to some guys before he signed with New England, possibly. You know, like uh, if to go and to get another quarterback who got even one tier five vote, you have to go all the way down to Marcus Mariota at number twenty seven, <laughs> who's the highest quarterback in tier four. I mean, I'm gonna, not that I'm going to say who. I need to, I'm just going to scroll over here and say who gave him a five quarterback coach, maybe. So that would be. Like if you when you start talking to quarterback coaches, I don't have a ton of them in there, but you, you then you get into guys who have preferences for their flavors of ice cream, right? Like like a per- personnel guy honors the talent. Like a personnel guy is probably going to be the highest guy on Cam Newton, right? I mean, oh man, you yeah. can do so much, coach. You got to figure it out. I, you know, you got your system. You may want a different type of guy, but tough. This guy checks the boxes, man. I mean, he is a. But you get down to the real granular level with a quarterback coach, and he's like, you know. He likes a certain type of guy. You know what I mean? You, you almost can learn as much about a voter sometimes. That number, that five vote for Cam Newton tells us more about the voter than Cam, to me. That matches up with my experience in draft rooms. You'll, you'll have all the scouts out on the road with, with really, you know, like you said, respecting the talent and really oh, trying yeah. to be thoughtful about how they fit in. Well, you're fitting them in with your team, but you're considering how they fit into the league in general. You'll get to the coaches sometimes with their evaluations, and it'll just be absolutely upside down. They're like, oh, no, I don't want this quarterback. He's too tall. Uh, <laughs> just something yeah, like yeah. That. And and that'll do it. So yeah, yeah. Russell, yeah, Russell Wilson. Well, he he can't see. He won't be able to see. We don't want him. You know, or whatever. But he you can't know? play in our system. He can't play he can't in our play system. In our... That's what you hear them say. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, change your system, coach, because this guy can flat out play. You know, and the, and we're seeing more of that in the league. So yeah, definitely an outlier view on Cam. I wouldn't dwell on it much, but I think the fact that he gets votes in four tiers shows we we didn't know. You know, I mean, you're guessing on Cam. It's funny if you uh, probably quizzed me before he went to New England, I probably would have had him a tier lower than I would have had if you asked me after he signed with New England yeah. just because it kind of changes the expectation. Yep, I'm with you. Um, he's definitely a McDaniels kind of guy um, based on McDaniels' past preferences for, for Tebow's of the world. So I'm, in, I'm interested in seeing how that fit works out. Yeah, it's Cam to Tebow who can actually throw the ball, you know. That's pretty good. So Being able to throw the ball is an important part of playing quarterback. Throw the ball to its ball. target. You know, Cam has done that. Tebow, uh, not so much. Going from Cam Newton, I think the natural place to go from there is Tom Brady. Tom Brady tearing out uh, at the top of tier two. Yeah, I thought I thought he might get a, a you know a legacy exemption and, and get into tier one still, right? I mean, he had I, I perceive it to be maybe you know you have his statistical uh, you know arc in front of you. Maybe maybe he was declining before, but uh, I think last year clearly it wasn't as good. He didn't look as good, and you could make the case. Hey, his weaponry, offensive line, everything fell below a baseline level that that makes it hard then to put it all on him. You could have said this guy can still see it, you know. He still can get everybody. He can still he still makes accurate passes, all of that, right? But I think when you have it look so bad over the course of a season and then just flame out like they did in the playoffs, right? I mean, I think he was just done in New England, wasn't he? I mean, it was over in New England. And Everybody who reports here says, like, attitude-wise, he, he had basically written yeah. it off, that he yeah. was he was out. He was mentally out of here already. I'd give him a one. I, to me, I would be like, I agree. He probably needed more of the run game and needed things to be set up for him a certain way in New England, so you could make the case for it, too. I kind of might project that he has a better chance of becoming a one with the weaponry in Tampa. My concern being that Bruce Arians quarterbacks get slobber knocked. They get hit. And yep. I think if that happens, if that happens to Brady, I don't think he will be tier one. Yep. Never been a guy that liked taking hits. We have him down at 19th in, in passer points per snap over last year. And, and Aaron and I, I think would agree. He's had a, a kind of a steady sort of regression over the last few years from, from where he from was. From the MVP level of 2017, the last two years, there's definitely been regression each year. I, I do go tier two with him because I'd say this is a guy that is not somebody that you win because of any more. And I think a lot of people forget early in his career, he was kind of a, a prototypical tier two guy when they were winning the first couple of Super Bowls with him. He was not a guy that they were winning because of. Uh, they were really winning with the defense and what and him his ability to be a real win with guy. So I think it'll be really interesting. I think we're all I'm dying to see how it looks. Yeah, oh, me too. I can't wait. It's my number one storyline of the year, obviously. So. I'm used to – there's just a lot of those – Brady throws these passes where he throws it just out of the reach of his receiver because it's so important to him to not get intercepted. There just seemed like there were a lot more of those last year. Yeah, yeah, just give just, ups. Yeah. He, he just – he would throw it to where it was like there was a target – but yeah. it, it was going to be very difficult for, you know, Mohamed Sanu to reach that pass. And then he just like, 
you just see this look on his face afterwards, like oh, nobody was open, but he missed some guys who were open. He got so frustrated about nobody being open that he missed some guy. But, yeah. But the, that look was saying, you know, I think they're going to cut Muhammad Sanu after the year. That's how bad this <laughs> is. You know, I think he and Aaron Rodgers have something in common there. You know, I will say point. the argument that they didn't try to help him with receivers is a wrong one. I think they tried. Because they tried. They went out and draft pick drafted guy with number one pick. Uh, first first round pick, and they they traded a second for Sanu. They tried Antonio Brown. They signed Antonio Brown. It just <laughs> didn't work because Nikhil yeah. got hurt and Sanu yeah. was hurt, and Antonio Brown went See, insane. See, I th- I've always felt this like you know you need a baseline level of weaponry. What is that right to really be to be excellent? I'm working actually on a piece now for the Athletic on Aaron Rodgers that that hits on that, and you look at the progression of who's around him over time, and I think with Brady. Uh, when Gronk was there and you had one uh, for a while there, if you did the on off field stuff, like you can do with Gronk, uh, it's incredible. With, with Gronk, it was incredible. But then after a while, it became, he needed either Gronk or Edelman. Uh, but then when, if he had both, if you have both those guys, I don't think it's unreasonable to say you have one sort of, you know, blue kind of elite player on your team that you can throw to as a quarterback. Right. I mean, you should have that. That's not an unreasonable ask. We're not saying you have to have Andy Reid and the chiefs, but I think he had crap around him, and it showed. And I think that's a perfect segue to Aaron Rodgers, who uh, comes out number three in the rankings in, in, as a tier one guy, no longer unanimous as he was a few years ago, but still in the tier one. And I think him coming out at number three it would surprise a lot of fans out there um, that maybe have a different perception of him right now. Aaron knows well that total points had him number one in cumulative total points for quarterbacks last year, and he was number four in total points, uh, passer points per snap last year really he was number one on your thing it's kind of remarkable oh so um can you i'm interested i'm just interested in it so how does that work so it works a little bit similarly to qbr but i think we've had a little bit more data to work with than when when qbr was originally put together so basically what we try to do is take every play the expected points added on the play and divide it up amongst the 22 guys on the field um, and we do that using all the different sort of data that we chart here, whether it be, was the quarterback, did he throw an accurate pass? Was there a miscommunication between him and the receiver? Did the offensive line commit a blown block on the play? The the scheme and, and personnel that's being used in the play all affects the situations and how things will get distributed. So we kind of have a, a robust model. Alex Vigderman from our research team has been at the forefront of creating it. And it takes into account more than the basic box score stats to incorporate things like when he might be throwing it away and it's not something that's really that that should be something that's dinging him heavily. Another thing that he really likes about Rodgers is he didn't throw interceptable passes last year. Unbelievable. He, I thought when you were talking about Brady that way, I thought, I thought Rodgers' interception rate was already low and it went to like nothing. It was like that has to be intentional, you know, like he's just not going to risk it. But guys, we have our jobs are so freaking good. Can you believe we do this? This <laughs> is like we're 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 getting paid to do this, but I love like what you're talking about where we see numbers and then we watch the games, right? We want to watch them. And so I've been watching Rogers lately. And I, and I feel like if you put together his reel of incomplete passes, it'd be better than anyone, but Mahomes, Wilson, those real elite guys completed. I mean, he puts the ball in places unbelievably they the ball goes off jimmy graham's arm and it goes off his shoulder pad i was just watching this game you, you gotta watch this one against uh chicago i think it was in the season opener he's running out of the pocket across the field on a sprint to his right side okay and he just slows down at about the 50 yard line and throws it all the way back across both hashes the ball goes to the five yard line inside the numbers on the other side of the field and hits Jimmy Graham in the shoulder pad. It's incomplete. It's third and 17. How does his rotator cuff and labrum not lying on the turf? I mean, no one can do that. Mahomes could, I think Mahomes could do it. That's it. It's an unbelievable play. Unbelievable. And it's zero yards. I think and as I go through, there's a million of these when I watch Rodgers. There's a million of these plays. And everyone has some of them, but I feel like he has a lot of them. And Look who he's throwing to. He's got Devontae Adams and nothing. They got no tight end. When's the last time they had a good tight end? They don't even draft guys. Devontae Adams is the number one receiver, but he's like, what round pick was he? And he know. wasn't that good in his first couple of years. He's, he's not really he's improved not, over yeah, the course of his career. He's not. He's really a, a good player, but he's not like a special dynamic 
uh, athlete, right? I mean, he's he's really good. I he was a sec- he was a second that. rounder. He was yeah, a second, second rounder. Okay, so the other guys, the Kumaros of the world, and all these guys, I just feel like yeah. they are wasting a guy. Then you put in this play action offense where coaches who run that offense don't even want a great quarterback. I mean, uh, Kyle Shanahan's like, oh, could I just have Kirk Cousins? Seriously? Oh my <laughs> god! You know, that Gary That's Kubiak funny. is like, oh, could I have Matt Schaub for ten years? I mean, we're not even going to look for another guy. We get freaking shop, right? That's what they want. They're running this offense. It's like they have a Ferrari in the garage who can make that play that I just talked about, running full speed to the right and to the left. And they're like, if I could have a Subaru Legacy, this would be so great. I mean, if we got into the snow, we wouldn't slip. They got a Ferrari. Drive them. Go drive them fast. They are going to take this guy, and they're going to draft quarterback. They're not going to draft any weapons around them. They're going to read the stats going, God, Rodgers must be in decline. And this guy is going to be playing somewhere else in a year. And if they're not lucky, he's going to be winning the MVP and going to the Super Bowl with someone who knows how to do it, who knows how to put together a team around him. What if he got to the Raiders, the young receivers they have in a tight end? I mean, I'm just saying, I think this guy can flat out do it. The more I watch it, the more I'm convinced. And... I think think they're screwing it up. I think you're spot on. I think a lot of the perception of his year last year is based on uh, our our inability as humans to really watch every single game of every team in the league and remember everything that goes on accurately. We 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 tend to misremember things as humans sometimes based on uh, different perceptions that we have. It's telling that for the four non-first place votes he got, I think you said it was two cat people and two people that don't play against him. I think that's really telling. SISBets.com is back for 2020, and if you didn't make use of it last year, you missed out on easy money. SISBets.com is an advanced prop betting information tool powered by Sports Info Solutions. With it, you can leverage the power of our proven projections models to find value against the odds. You're never more than a few clicks away from knowing whether your favorite wide receiver is likely to score a touchdown this week or whether a quarterback that you have your eye on is likely to go over or under his completions prop. Just choose the bet type, the player, and the money line to see the SIS Bets recommendation. SISBets.com is available for just $9.99 per month, so it easily pays for itself, and that price covers both football and baseball. That means you can also take advantage of our most popular bet type, home run projections, which our users rode to a very solid 12% ROI in 2019. The best news is that if you act now, you can access SISBets.com for free for week one of the NFL season. So log on to SISBets.com, create your free account, win on your prop bets this Sunday, and then use your winnings to keep your account active so that you can continue to win. For your free trial account, sign up at SISBets.com. All right, moving forward from the quarterbacks that we've seen and that make it to the tiers list, what can we expect from the rookies coming into the league this year? I mean, first off, it's going to be Joe Burrow playing week one for Cincinnati. Uh, what kind of expectations do you have there? Well, I'm a little bit hopeful because I think they've ha- they have some good skill players there. I'm always worried about them with their you know injuries and AJ Green and all that. But you know, they at least they drafted a, a, a left tackle, right? They've they drafted wide receiver. You've got you know hopefully. AJ Green can help them. They've got a decent running back. So there's some there's something there. You know, I think what the things that worry me are uh, you know, you've got a very unproven coach, right? In a organization that's been challenging. Maybe we have a greater appreciation for Marvin Lewis. Uh, and so you're bringing in this uh, young player who seems extremely promising, but it's hard to ultimately transcend questionable organization, right? I mean, we saw Carson Palmer, I think, checked a lot of boxes, really got frustrated there, forced his way out had a little bit of rocky time, had some injuries, and then he got with you know a, a better situation and he was in the MVP discussion, right? So my hope for for Burrow is that what's around him, that he can be nurtured properly. And and uh, they've had some quarterback success there. You know, uh, Andy Dalton probably met or exceeded his expectations. So I'm generally hopeful, but also understanding, I mean, it's a very weird off season and to do what Dalton did under similar circumstances, I just don't know if they have the same team. You remind me of uh, when I was a scouting assistant in New Orleans. I can't remember who the player was, but he had just come from a visit in Cincinnati, and then he was visiting us there. And players get a per diem when they come on their visit, you know, if you're not taking them out for a meal so they can go get lunch, whatever, stuff like that. There's a, it's, a, it's in the CBA, what they're supposed to get. He told me that the Bengals paid him by check 
why would they pay you by check? And he said, I kept <laughs> hoping that I wouldn't cash it in. <laughs> it's like, hard to go get yourself lunch with a cash check. Yes. They, Very they old so school. <laughs> that they were just hoping he wouldn't cash the check. Probably signed by Mike Brown personally. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. So uh, I, I do like Burrow, though. I mean, he had a he had a wonderful season, and, and so I I am hopeful. Um, but golly, it is a is a tough time to be putting a guy out there in week one, probably, right? Absolutely. When you look back over the last few years, is there something that you learn as rookies go from being you know once they get playing time and they start to get ranked in the tiers? Are there any patterns that you've noticed as, as far as that goes over what seven years of doing it? Uh, yeah, there will usually only be one or two guys who make a who make a big jump, you know, like, like this last year or, you know, after your first year of being in order to be in the tiers poll. Now you have to have uh, played a season, right? So we don't really do anybody before they come in, but uh, it's usually about one guy who um, will be relatively high. So two years ago, Baker Mayfield came in right between second and third tier. You know, I think people were a little optimistic and then, you know, they train wrecked the organization, right? I mean, he, he went from having a professional quarterback coach and, you know, a, a halfway decent situation to the Freddie Kitchen show, right? And, and it was a disaster. So he fell back down. This year it was kind of Kyler Murray, right? I mean, Kyler Murray played a whole year. I don't know that he was great, but you saw enough to like some of the things you saw and you feel going into the second year, hey, they're not going to Freddie Kitchens him, right? They're going to have the same scheme. It seemed to, they found a little bit of balance with how they wanted the approach things. And, and so he came to the top of tier three. I think I, what we learned though, is a lot of times you Murray regressed a little bit, right? I mean, one, one year early on Derek Carr, you know, on the promise was able to sort of press up maybe even in the second tier. There's a reason I think it's, it's smart to just withhold a little judgment, right? I mean, give it a little bit of body of work, give it a couple of years because Derek Carr isn't seen that way. And he's just as talented as he was. Right. And, Mayfield may not. So the lesson may be, is Kyler Murray going to be this high in a year? And if he is, he maybe he beat the odds. Lamar Jackson is sort of like that too. Like people may be looking and being like, why is Lamar Jackson not a tier one? And the answer is give it a little bit of time, like one year. Don't make your judgment on one year. You know? But he was so amazing that he actually got 16 tier one votes. I mean, that, right. that's fairly unusual huh, to go that high. He, he, the whole thing he gets in with is, you know, in being able to, there's one, one of my worries in my column today was just being, being able to pass the ball when you have to. And that's a hard thing to do. And it's so the opposite of what they do the rest of the time, right? That uh, it doesn't come naturally for them. But uh, I think he's still going to be high this year. I don't think he's going to come crashing down. But I agree. I, I, I can make a strong case for top of tier two for him and, and uh, as a quarterback as opposed to just a, a raw football player. And we'll see what that means for Murray. What do you guys think? Do you think Murray's going to climb? I like Murray this year. Yeah, definitely. Do yeah, I see so. Murray as an ascending player uh, in in the same in the same right? And I think they've done some work to try to shore up the offensive line there, which I think is is kind of an underrated storyline for me going into the season. Yeah, offensive line is really really difficult in general, and so uh, just with all the roster turnover, lack of practice, lack of preseason, the potential for injuries, I, that's one thing that I focus on because I think you know we saw the Bengals really degrade to a point last year where. They couldn't run an NFL offense. They they could, they didn't have a drop back game because they didn't have a passing game. They they could really it was a high school offense to a certain extent uh, by the end of the year, and um, I, I think that that could be a thing that happens to other teams this year. And, and we might be surprised to see uh, who it happens to just based on on the way injuries are coming down. Do you think that Burrow's going to be uh, okay this year? I do think Burrow's going to be okay. I think the thing that makes Burrow that makes me feel a little bit better about him is the fact that. He's been in college football for years and years. This is not a, a redshirt yeah. sophomore coming out. He's learned two systems. He's acclimated with two systems. This is the, the third time he's doing it in six years. Um, I think it's going to be different. I think the speed of the NFL is going to be tough. But, but I do believe that, that they're going to fit him into a system where they're not going to try to overwhelm him with anything this year. They'd rather take a loss than ask him to do something yeah. that he can't do. And maybe he has a Baker Mayfield type of rookie season and we're, we're in a year where, you know, he's high three, you know, maybe even a low two if he had a good year. Yeah, I'm very intrigued by him. I'm very intrigued by, by Tua. And you mentioned earlier that you were a Hall of Fame balloter. So I wanted to, uh, I wanted to ask yeah. about your Hall of Fame voting and kind of how that relates to the QB tiers. I was wondering, have you ever thought about using the QB tier system as sort of a tool for Hall of Fame battle balloting? Is there is there a yeah. way to incorporate it? 
Yeah, you know, a little bit. Yeah, I did a fun project when I worked at ESPN, maybe in about 2017, where I just called a bunch of guys who'd been around the game a long time, Mike Shanahan, Mike Holmgren, you know, guys like that. Uh, we had Howard Mudd on there, rest in peace, Howard. Uh, the guys you've just seen a lot, you know, over the years. And and what I did is I pulled uh, I pulled a lot of stuff off of Pro Football Reference. I think we did it since 1978 with the rules changed. I wanted to, you know, compare people that had played under somewhat similar passing era rules and I was just kind of looking at like which one of these guys could win the high scoring games. You know, I think that's a, uh, you know, a very rough raw way of looking at things over time and how many of these guys are winning because, you know, the other team scored 12 points. Right. I mean, we forget even for like a Joe Montana, he had great defenses. That makes a huge difference. I mean, it's a 90 in the league right now. If the other team doesn't score 17 points, it's a 90% win, you know, for anybody. I don't care if you're a tier four quarterback, you, you win, you'll have, have a great record in those games. So I do, I have looked at some stuff like that and you realize, you know, I, you get an appreciation for Dan Fouts, right? I mean, somebody like that, I think we can see, uh, you know, Dan Marino is an extreme case of that. Just guys who've had to put it on their shoulders and, and had to be the reason why their teams won and had to do it with bad defenses, right? Like for me, when Eli Manning comes up, it's going to be hard for me because He's in a lot of ways had a Hall of Fame career. I mean, you're he's a Manning playing for the Giants. He won two Super Bowls and made incredible plays in those Super Bowls to win the game. But he was like, to me, never really one of the five best quarterbacks in the league. He was sort of a guy that if you're facing him as a DB, you're like, I might get one this week. You weren't like just, oh, she's I, I think I've got a cramp. I think my hamstrings tightening up. I can't go this week. You know, you know what I mean. Yeah, and so that I do think about it that way. Eli Manning, I've only been doing this since 2014. He was never tier one on that. You know, he's a fascinating case. I think uh, for the reasons why you mentioned, he does have the longevity, the counting stats, which era adjusted are not as impressive. But yeah. certainly, if you look at him on the all time lists, but I think instead of the the ring counting that people do, where it's like Eli Manning, one ring, not a Hall of Famer, two rings, Hall of yeah. Famer. I think it'd be a unanimous number one. You get four points. If you're a, a number one, you get three points. If you're a number two, you get one point. And you can somehow accumulate points for being in the QB tiers for, for a certain number of years. If you have enough longevity at, at enough high tiers, maybe that's a better qualifier than, than just looking at rings. Yeah, and certainly if I had had this going back, you know, to 2005 or something, you know, we, we would have an easier time of doing that. But maybe I'll just keep doing it and – you know, in 10 years from now, you'll have whole careers, even as youthful, you know, I'll be just as youthful looking as I am today. And uh, maybe I would have it. I think that would be awesome to have. And I think that would be telling to be able to tell people that this is what people thought, you know, it's a, uh, I have this wonderful spreadsheet where I have, you know, a row for every guy every year. And it's fun to go and see what's the progression for a franchise, you know, uh, what's the, is this the highest ranked guy they've, they've had, you know, I mean, that, that's helpful information to me just to big picture it. And uh, before you get out of here, I just want to ask you one more question. Uh, I saw your article today on The Athletic. You wrote about what each team has to be concerned about this year. I'm wondering, as you were going through that, listening to the different people around the league that you talked to, were there any concerns that were most eye-popping to you? Anything that really stood out to you? I think there's a lot of them that deal with, with quarterbacks. So that's at one level of them. But Denver was interesting to me because, you know, the offensive tackle situation. I think they're a team that if things had come together, you could have made a case that that's a team to watch, right? Hey, who's your sleeper team? You know, okay. Mm -hmm. You know, I think Denver could really do it. And we just think that actually. <laughs> yeah. And, but just sort of obviously the Von Miller thing, you know, uh, scares us off. But I think that like, I was really intrigued by the fact that like, I think pro football focus had Garrett Bowles having a good finish to the season, but I don't think he, uh, the people in football didn't think that like, he's a big liability at left tackle. Jawan, uh, James opted out at right tackle. So you're going to bring Drew Locke in, who we're excited about, and you're going to have, from the get-go, a very tenuous tackle situation, right? And now you've got your two pass rushers, one of them coming off an ACL, the other one out for the year, with a defense that probably anyway has lost some of its bite, you know, just from a pure talent perspective of where they were at their glory time when they won the Super Bowl. Is this a team now that's going to be, at, you know, Drew Locke's going to be dropping back with trailing by more than one score with no one who can pass protect him? I feel like they've almost in my mind, I, I could talk them to being a, in a disappointing team. Is that, is that too much of a shift in too short of a time? I, I literally wondered the same thing because with Vaughn going down, I was like, oh, okay, I'm out on my on my secret <laughs> pick. 
And if you're if you're worried about losing Jawan James at tackle, I know you've got really big problems at tackle. <laughs> I know, I know, and, and but it, you only have so many guys that you can lose. It's kind of like what's happening in Philly, right? They have a good offensive line, and suddenly you take away this guy, that guy, and you're like, oh, we're down to our third. Are we down? If you get down, if you're going into week one on your third tackle, you know what I mean. So let's just say for them, Bowles and James are their top two. Well, James is out. Bulls already is only starting because they drafted him early. It's uh, The GM needs to give it as long of a go as he can. If he was a fifth-round pick, they would have benched him and signed someone in free agency. Fact, right? Garrett Bulls, w- if he was a, th- a fourth-round pick, he would have been replaced by now. They would have been in the oh, free agent sure. market. They would have gotten Russell Okung or whatever. whatever. They wouldn't have got him because he got traded. But you know what I mean. They would have been in the market. So do they have backups to backups playing at tackle? I mean, that's tough. Rookie quarterback. Yeah, they also have a rookie center, right? They drafted a guy. They yeah, drafted and, the guy you know, from LSU. And, and the stats aren't really pretty for Garrett Bowles last year. He matches up with t- tough people, which, which helps him in terms of total points because he gets a little bit of benefit for that. But 24 total blown blocks on the year, 19 of them in the pass game. Really not great yeah. stuff there uh, from him. So, like, so just, I'm worried. You know, I think that's the one that stood out to me as a worry of a team that we could have painted this glass as half full. And now we can like see the leaks in the glass and we're like, shoot, even if it is half full, it's going to be a third full in about two weeks. <laughs> and in the weapons, the weapons there are so good on offense. If that offensive line can't get it together though, then, then it's all for naught. Although I do yeah. find the whole, we had this discussion already. I do find the whole, the weapons are so good on offense expects a lot from rookies. People expect, like I saw someone write about the Vikings online a couple of days ago, like, well, you know, Jefferson's going to come in and be great. You can't say ever that you a rookie's going to come. You don't know in. that. You yeah. Just don't know. <laughs> yeah, you don't know. So you don't uh, know what Judy, like, even though we believe Judy is a great prospect, you don't know what Judy will be. You don't know what Hamler will be. We don't know what Locke will be. <laughs> don't know what Locke will be. We have so, no idea. So we don't like the offensive tackles. We don't know what the quarterback is. We don't know what the great skill players are. And we don't have our best pass rusher. Best player, wow. period. Yeah. Best player, period. I mean, call. Hey, good luck, Vic Fangio. You know, you got to win eight games or you're going to be fired. You know what? <laughs> and, oh, and by the way, uh, Chiefs are in your division. You're going to play them twice. Right. Uh, you know, I mean, call. Oh. And yeah, I'll just throw one more just to pile on Garrett Bowles a little bit. Ten penalties last year, including five holds. So the more I keep digging, the more I keep finding things that uh, yeah. <laughs> they didn't pick up the option for a reason. Right. So uh, that I think that's a team that stood out from the from the 32 teams, 32 worries column that ran on the athletic today. All right. Well, on that note, we can sign out of here. I'd like to remind all the listeners that you can find Mike Sando on The Athletic. Um, As he mentioned, he's got that article that came out today. I highly recommend checking out the quarterback tiers article. There's there's no better inside information that you're getting really, really well-sourced stuff from inside the league. Mike, is there anything you'd like to plug before we get out of here? You know, you can find me at Sando NFL. I'm, I think I'm only the second person to have a podcast now, right? No one has one. Uh, but we, I just started one with Randy Mueller, the old uh, general manager, two-time general manager, uh, who I've known for 20 years. And so we're, we're getting out of the gates on that, excited about that. If you go to Sando NFL, you might see that in some of the other work that I do for The Athletic. Thank you guys so much. I, I, I learned and I got better, and hopefully we all did. Absolutely. That's the goal every day. As always, listeners, you can check out footballoutsiders.com for lots of great content. You can find Aaron at FB Outsiders. Sports Info Solutions, of course, we're gearing up for the season tonight. You can check out the Data Hub and the Data Hub Pro at sisdatahub.com or pro.sisdatahub.com, depending on if you're ready to throw down money or not uh, for the best stats that we have. For my co-host, Aaron Schatz, our guest, Mike Sando, and our producers, Justin Stein and Mark Simon, I'm Matt Manicharian, and thank you for joining us for the latest episode of the Off the Charts Football Podcast. Happy football tonight.